This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, and uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, session of the cardiovascular grand rounds. And uh, it gives me great honor to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Amber Khanna. Uh, Dr. Khanna actually did her uh, bachelor's of arts and sciences in the University of South Dakota, moved on subsequently to School of Medicine there and uh, UT Medical School and uh, subsequently uh, did a master's in uh, Colorado. Uh, after which she then, uh, that was her formal uh, education as well. In addition to that, she has done her residency and fellowship at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, as well as I had the honor and privilege of overlapping with her during cardiology fellowship at uh, Mayo Clinic. And she then went on to do adult congenital. And she is now, uh, at the Associate Professor of Medicine level at the uh, section of Adult Congenital Heart Disease at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Uh, she's done a lot of work into um, uh, psychiatric issues in uh, especially her adult congenital patients. She's also done a lot of, uh, mentored a lot of residents and fellows. Uh, she's just an absolute pleasure to work with and I can verify this uh, personally as well. Uh, and uh, without much uh, further introduction, Dr. Kana, please. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, let's, see, let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, I have no disclosures. Um, this research was funded by the NIH and the CDC. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of background information about congenital heart disease and mental health and then talk about the CDC project that I worked on. Um, we'll then transition over to the NIS project. And finally, the most exciting part, future work. So as prevalence, as background, I think that most people know that the prevalence of congenital heart disease in North America is increasing. So on this somewhat complicated graph, you can see that the absolute estimates of adults continues to exponentially rise. Um, the, prevalence amongst, or the absolute incidence among children is fairly stable. And then it, the ratios are changing over time because of this growth in adults. So that in the United States, there are now approximately 1.4 million adults uh, and 1 million children. This is all data from uh, Canada that has been extrapolated into the United States. These patients have an evolving cadre of comorbidities. Uh, so obviously they have cardiac complications, including heart failure and arrhythmias, uh, but they, uh, the congenital heart disease really affects multiple different systems within the body. And so I sat down with our um, patient advisory panel for a research project and asked them, what do they really care about? What, what sort of keeps them up at night? What do they want to know more about? And uh, after sort of going through a variety of different things, endocarditis and heart failure and arrhythmias, procedures, what it really came down to was mental health. I was a bit surprised by this. Um, I thought they would wanna know about absolute mortality um, and uh, those kind of things, but it was overwhelming that what they wanted to know more about was how anxiety, depression, and other forms of mental health really impact their their lives and what we, can we do about it. Thinking more about it, it became more clear about um, why this was important. Mental health has a huge impact on quality of life. Uh, if you know you can be in perfect health, but if you suffer from severe depression or severe anxiety, quality of life is really limited. Um, there are lots of reasons why mental health may be more important in congenital heart disease. Uh, these patients often undergo significant stress and trauma in childhood, um, sometimes um, in infancy, but also in toddler age, it can impact how family relationships uh, and then going into adolescence and adulthood continues to play a major role. There's some data that actually undergoing a bypass runs can in fact how the brain chemistry works. There's often associated ischemic and hypoxic events. And then there's genetics. So sometimes the genetics such as 22Q11 or DeGeorge syndrome can uh, be associated with congenital heart disease, but also be associated with, um, with mental health issues such as schizophrenia. 
the impact is large. If you don't think about it, then you don't ask about it, you don't diagnosis, you don't manage it, you don't refer it, you don't treat it. It's also important in resource planning. So if you're gonna develop a really robust adult congenital heart disease program, you need to account for mental health. There's no perfect way to study mental health. Prior work has focused on different modalities, uh, but obviously the most robust is to actually test patients and do a um, psychologic analysis um, to, to figure out what their, what their mental status currently is. Um, that's obviously very labor intensive. Clinic surveys are another option. And then finally, there's chart review. So here are just a couple of the prior studies. So in this studies from the Boston program, they looked at 22 different adults. Um, these were all adults who were just in clinic for routine follow-up. Their cardiologist thought that they were well adjusted and that they did not have mental health issues. Um, they had no previous psychiatric diagnosis and were on no medications. They underwent one hour semi-structured psychiatric interviews and a third of them had a diagnosable psychiatric disorder, mostly anxiety and depression. The second study, you can see the N increases a bit. So now we're up to 347 patients. They were able to match it with 353 non-congenital heart disease controls. And they found similar rates with probable anxiety of 38% and probable depression in 18%. Because their surveys, the diagnostic um, ability goes down. They found that anxiety and somatic symptoms were higher in the congenital heart disease population. They actually found no difference in depression. So despite fairly high rates of depression, that was what was also um, present in the general population. They found that financial strain was associated with anxiety, depression, and with somatic symptoms. And then finally, in this most recent work done by Matthew Carrazzo, um, who, when he was at Boston as well, he looked at the um, adult congenital biobank there, looked at a thousand different patients enrolled in the biobank and found depression in a similar rates, about 20%. Uh, it was associated with higher high sensitive CRP as well as higher BNP. Uh, and it was associated with an increase in all cause mortality. So you can see as the end goes up, your diagnostic specificity goes down, um, but that's sort of the nature of the beast. Prior work has really been focused on anxiety and depression, which is much more common, uh, but it's much more, we need to be thinking about more than just anxiety and depression. Um, going along with that, um, dementia, trauma history, phobias, these are all present in this population. It's important to remember that causation does not, is not the same as correlation. Um, so, uh, there are multiple studies and hypotheses, but it really probably goes in both directions. So patients who, are, who have significant heart disease may be at increased risk of mental illness, and then mental illness can actually impact heart disease. And this is through medication adherence, clinic visits, exercise, diet, as well as things like cortisol levels and catecholamines. So let's move on to the first project that we talked about. Um, so this was, through the CDC, um, and I'll focus mostly on the Colorado aspect of it. So the purpose of, this, of the general study was to evaluate the full spectrum of mental illness in a population-based cohort of adolescents and adults with congenital heart disease. In 2015, Colorado was selected to develop a population-based surveillance system of adolescents and adults with congenital heart disease. Other funded sites, sites were obviously Emory, um, and Wendy Book led the project here. And Duke, the New York Department of Health and the University of Utah were the other sites in this large project. The goal was to develop a population-based surveillance system. Um, Colorado has a population of 3.9 million uh, in, this, in this age range. Uh, the, we wanted to improve um, understanding of survival, healthcare utilization, uh, long-term outcomes look at racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic patterns, um, and then really understand the strengths and limitations of an integrated surveillance for congenital heart disease in Colorado. So as I said, we looked at all patients aged 11 to 64. 
all healthcare encounters from January 1, 2011 to December 31st, 2013. Uh, congenital heart disease was diagnosed based on an ICD-9 code of 745 to 747, excluding the diagnosis of 745.5. And Rusty Rodriguez did nice work on this particular diagnostic code. He found that amongst this particular code, um, which is the code for secundum atrial septal defect, only about a quarter of the patients that had this code in isolation had a secundum ASD, about a half of them had a PFO, and a fourth of them either had normal or other congenital heart defect. So because of the very significant lack of specificity of this code, we excluded it when it was occurring in isolation. Our data sources here in Colorado, um, we have a, a data warehouse called Compass, and it is for the University of Colorado, Children's Hospital Colorado, and then our billing agency. Uh, so there are five different hospitals associated with this and uh, the state's only adult congenital heart disease center. We also uh, were able to obtain data from Denver Health, which is our safety net hospital here in Denver, um, as well as Kaiser, other healthcare systems and the Colorado's all payers claim database. So overall we had a total of 25,000 cases um, identified. There was one major health system called Health One that did not participate. A major part of our research project was to do record linkage and deduplication. So like many places, patients um, cross over between different healthcare systems. So they may come and see me for adult congenital cardiology, but their, their neurosurgery may be somewhere else or their primary care may be with another healthcare system. So we wanted to uh, um, not overestimate our numbers by looking, by assuming that patients aren't seen across systems. So we tried to link them and then deduplicate them in the, in our database. Uh, to deduplicate, we looked at, we looked at um, private health information and tried to match them. Here are a couple of examples of when it gets tricky. So this is a patient where there's a misspelling in the last name. And you can tell if, if patient number one is in one healthcare system, patient number two is in another healthcare system, these should obviously be the same patient and it's just a spelling error. This is a common example where you have somebody with the same name and the exact same address, but their birthdays are off. And their birthdays are off by 22 years. Uh, so this is um, a father and a son and it should not be deduplicated in the system, even though their PHI matches on multiple levels. This is where it gets tricky, where humans are able to tell that Suzanne Bailey with the date of birth of 3-4 on tree fall lane is the same Suzanne Bailey, spelled differently, with a birth date of 4-3 on tree fall lane. So as, as humans, we're able to very much tell that this is the same patient, um, but the algorithms in the computers would probably identify this as separate patients. So th this will, it'll never be perfect we, for the patients that perfectly matched and were easily deduplicated, the computer did that, their potential matches, um, those were all reviewed by human eyes. After identifying the congenital heart disease, we then worked on identifying mental illness. So as most of you know, there are more than 14,000 different diagnostic codes in the ICD-9. Uh, so we needed to group them together to um, better understand the data. Thankfully, the HCUP, Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, has a series of tools and software and databases that have really helped us understand uh, these diagnostic codes and use them in clinical research. This is all sponsored through the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. These are the mental health categories. Um, as part of this large project uh, from the CDC, we've learned that there are lumpers and splitters. Lumpers are people who tend to categorize more of these diagnostic codes together um, in terms of making it simpler to understand. Uh, splitters are people who really like to go into the nuances of the different diagnostic codes. Uh, so I am a, probably a lumper because with these codes, I combined, I combined 652 and 656 in, and called it um, conduct or externalizing disorders. I combined alcohol and substance related use and then post hoc, I combined um, personality disorders and uh, miscellaneous because these were both very small 
there's a screening code for screening and history of, and I eliminated that code. So for this project, these were my final CCS codes. Um, the developmental codes tend to be delays, such as speech delays, motor delays, dyslexia, learning disab disabilities. Um, the diagnoses frequently come diagnosed in childhood include tics and Tourette's, uh, separation anxiety, and uh, the autism spectrum disorders are in that group. Moving back to congenital heart disease, when we talk about severity of congenital heart disease, um, uh, it's, it's important to understand that different things feed into severity. Um, so if we want to look at the spectrum, we really want to low, you know, are more severe patients more likely affected with mental health or the less severe? Um, when we think about severity, it, we previously really focused on diagnosis. And in children, it actually still works out pretty well. The diagnos diagnosis, meaning are you a tetralogy of Fallot, um, transposition of the great arteries, really defines the severity of your congenital heart disease. What we know in adulthood is that complications such as arrhythmias or heart failure, as well as comorbidities such as kidney disease or history of a stroke, feed into severity as well. These are our most recent uh, adult congenital guidelines published in 2018. And with these guidelines came a new classification system uh, where they take anatomy and physio physiologic stage and put it into an AP classification. So these are some examples of the, of the, of the A of the anatomy um, in terms of simple, moderate, and great complexity. So the simple ones are very simple and the list is actually pretty short. So it's atrial septal defects, ventricular septal defects, mild pulmonary stenosis, repaired PDA. The moderate list is by far the longest list. Um, so this is just a sampling of them. It's anomalous pulmonary venous connections, primum ASD, coarctation, um, congenital valve disease, moderate to severe pulmonary stenosis, and tetralogy of Fallot ends up in the moderate list. Great complexity are all of our fontans, all of our single ventricles, and then any form of transposition of the great arteries, as well as uh, truncus arteriosus. They then look at physiologic stage um, and correlated across A, B, C, and D. So physiologic stage A are our patients who are doing fantastic. You know, you really can't tell by looking at them, by talking to them, by putting them on a treadmill that they have congenital heart disease. Um, B is pretty well controlled and doing well. So most of my clinic patients tend to fall into B. Uh, some of them are more into the C range where they have arrhythmias, but we're controlling it with treatments. They have moderate valve disease, um, some form of venous or arterial stenosis, maybe mild hypoxia. And then category D is really our most severe patients. So what's, what the problem is, is that, that the anatomy stage doesn't correlate into ICD codes very well. So you end up with these codes that don't really fit. Um, so this was our classification scheme. It doesn't exactly fit with the current guidelines, partly because we did the project before the current guidelines, um, but also prior work um, by Morelli out of Canada has always put tetralogy of Fallot and atrial ventricular septal defects in a severe category. So to be consistent with Canadian work um, on epidemiology, uh, we stuck with this classification scheme. To diagnose our moderate severity lesions, we uh, chose some moderate moderate lesions, such as Epstein's anomaly, subaortic stenosis. But then we also included any patient that had a shunt, so an ASD, and a valve problem. So if you had an ASD and moderate mitral regurgitation, then you came into the moderate lesion. And what's frustrating for this work is that most of these diagnoses um, have a very wide spectrum from being mild to very severe. So I think we've seen patients with Epstein's anomaly who are diagnosed in their 60s. The valve is clearly epstenoid, it's apically displaced, um, but they're doing well. There's no regurgitation or minimal regurgitation and the RV function is fine. Um, to a very severe neonatal Epstein's anomaly that go down a transplant pathway. So what this 
classification does is even in terms of anatomy, it doesn't really um, define the spectrum of disease very well. And this was our very long list of Eisenmenger syndrome. Here's diving into the data a little bit. So we ended up with 9,000 patients in this, in this study. It's a very, um, it is not representative of the entire population. Again, partly because we excluded those ASDs, um, but also it just based on our um, criteria. So very roughly, there are probably 14,000 patients in, the, in Colorado with congenital heart disease. Um, the others just didn't have visits in the right time frame or they didn't touch one of the healthcare systems that we recruited from. A very similar split between male and females. Although all of these patients had congenital heart disease, only half of them saw a cardiologist in the time frame from the study. The demographics matched the demographics of Colorado with a predominantly non-Hispanic white population. We were missing a race and ethnicity on a good number of patients. Um, most patients had private insurance with government insurance coming close behind. We looked at patients with and without mental illness um, and we separated them into the adolescent population, which was about 2000 patients and the adult population, which was about 7,000 patients. We found an overall prevalence of mental health diagnosis in 20% of our adolescents and a third of our adults. Um, in our adolescents, inpatient admissions, um, were, there were more inpatient admissions in patients with uh, mental health disorder uh, as well as in our, our adult population. The adult population also were more likely to have a cardiology visit and more likely to have um, more cardiac procedures. This is the full spectrum of mental illness in our population. Um, again, mood and anxiety disorders were much more common. The light blue is the adult population, the dark blue is the adolescent population. So much more common in adults um, Substance-related disorders, developmental disorders were also common um, with, uh, not surprisingly, the substance-related disorders in adults. Um, developmental externalizing disorders, disorders in childhood were much more common in the adolescent population. When we focused in on our patients with mood and anxiety disorders, this was the age range of those patients um, at the time of our study. So it's not across the lifespan. Um, in this two year, three year cohort study. Uh, what you can see is that mood disorders are, they peak around the age of 50, anxiety disorders peak around the age of 40. And this is prevalence per 100 persons. We wanted to know if there was an association between the severity of congenital heart disease and the presence of mental illness and found that for many things such as um, such as anxiety um, and, our, and our mood disorders, there was, a, there was a weak association in adolescents and a stronger association in adults between the severity of congenital heart disease and mental illness. Um, obviously in some of the childhood ones, there was a stronger association. We also wanted to know if there was a relationship between cardiac procedures and mental illness. So this compared uh, um, two cohorts of patients, one that had three or more cardiac procedures versus a group that had none. So we excluded the patients that had one or two cardiac procedures uh, and found that overall there was increased, um, increased prevalence of or increased risk of a mental health disorder if you have more cardiac procedures. Our final analysis was looking at genetic syndrome. So these were patients that had any diagnostic genetic syndrome um, during the time period and mental health disorders and found that uh, they were more, more likely to have um, delirium, dementia, developmental disorders, disorders usually diagnosed in childhood and externalizing disorders. I guess, again, not surprising, um, they were much less likely to have alcohol and substance use disorders. There are limitations to this study. Um, in order to be included in the study, you had to see a provider between 2011 and 2013. You had to receive a congenital heart diagnostic code. You had to receive a mental health diagnosis, have that diagnosis coded and billed for, and all of the providers have to be in the participating system. 
Um, so because of all of this, I think that we are truly underestimating um, risks of, of mental illness. Take home points are there's a high prevalence of mental health disorders in this population. 20% of adults, a third, or 20% of adolescents, a third of adults. Uh, and uh, it's associated with increased health care utilization and associated with genetic syndromes. And the highest prevalence was in this 40 to 50 year old population. We then uh, moved on. Um, and uh, this is what Dr. Kumar uh, invited me to participate in. So he looked at the, with Dr. Desai, he looked at the na nationwide frequency sequential trends and impact of comorbid mental health disorders on hospitalizations, outcome and healthcare resource utilization in uh, adults with congenital heart disease. So using national data, using the National Inpatient Sample or NIS, which is again, part of HCUP and H AHRQ, uh, this database includes 1,000 hospitalizations covering 44 different states and has 8 million discharges per year. The, the span of this research study was longer than the first one, going from 2007 to 2014. They, we used CCS codes, um, so the code for congenital heart disease was 213, and limited to, to just adults, ages 18 and up. So there were 85,000 adult congenital heart disease patients. So following the trend of the three previous studies, um, the main study that I participated in, this one now has a much greater and a much larger patient population. Of the 85,000 adult congenital heart disease admissions, 73,000 did not have mental health disorder, 11,700 did have mental health disorder for an overall prevalence of 14%. Again, remember this is only hospitalization um, inpatient stay coding data. Uh, so that 14% is likely an underestimate. The, we divided the data into patients who did not have a mental health disorder and patients that did, uh, found no significant difference in the age, um, did find that women, uh, that people with mental health disorders were more likely to be women, more likely to have hypertension, um, and uh, more likely to have dyslipid dyslipidemia. So overall increased risk of uh, comorbidities. Uh, interesting, there was not a, there was actually a bit protection um, from all cause mortality. So not a significant difference in terms of mortality between the um, mental health disorders and those without. And certainly mental health disorders do not increase all cause mortality. Um, it was associated with an increased length of stay um, and these patients were less likely to be discharged home. So more likely to be discharged to a nursing home um, or transferred to another facility. What was most interesting about this project was the trends going between the years of 2007 and the years 2014. And found that there was a 10% prevalence in 2007 and 18% prevalence in 2014. Um, some of this may be just increased awareness um, and it's hard with this kind of data, it's hard to know exactly why those numbers are going up. Uh, we did find that it was across the age span. So regardless of your age, the trends were increasing over the course of the years of the study and also found that for both men and women, the, the prevalence of psychiatric disorder or mental health disorder increased over the course of the study. Implications of this project um, uh, are that mental health, again, mental health disorders are common in this population, um, both hospitalized and ambulatory. Uh, it really is crucial if you want to provide comprehensive patient-centered care to think about mental health disorders. Um, uh, and it, it's important to increase awareness of it so that even if you're seeing these patients in your cardiology clinic, you need to Think about it, because if you don't think about it, then you don't diagnose it and you don't refer to appropriate therapies and uh, treatment options. Um, uh, the overall goal is to encourage mechanisms for better screening and managing these patients with coexisting congenital heart disease and mental illness. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about future direction. So. Uh, as you can see, the, a, a large body of work has been done on the epidemiology of mental health disorders um, in cardiac patients and 
more importantly to me, in adult congenital heart disease patients. There's obviously more work that can be done in terms of better understanding risk factors and uh, focusing in on how to, how to identify patients. But one of the directions that I'm most excited about moving into is perioperative mental health. Um, so our patients, they present, you know, so the typical patient is I've, I've followed them for several years. Their aortic stenosis is slowly getting worse, um, uh, but they're still feeling fine. They're still exercising fine. So I see them for follow-up and I say, okay, that, you know, things are looking good. Let's come back in a year. And we sort of follow this pattern for, for a while. Um, and then finally, it something tips. So say it's severe pulmonary regurgitation. We've been following the RV size and it crosses, it crosses a threshold. So I say, okay, it looks like it's time for you to have a new pulmonary valve or your aortic stenosis is now severe. Your exercise tolerance is a little bit dropping. I think it's time for you to have heart surgery. Um, from the time I tell them that, yep, it's time we should, you, you know, we have to do this now. To the time they have surgery, there's a window. That window varies, but it tends to be a few weeks. Um, I sit down with them for about a half hour, tell them it's time for heart surgery, uh, answer some questions. Um, some of them, it's their third or fourth surgery. It's sort of old hat. Sometimes it's their very first surgery. Uh, but then I send them off into the world. They're going to meet with the surgeon probably a week or two later, and then uh, Surgery is actually scheduled probably a week or two after that. In that window, not much happens other than uh, I think that anxiety increases. Um, and uh, what the, the patients have said that they, they have so many questions and there's so much unknown about heart surgery, but they don't, we don't have any sort of resources available to, to help them in that very discreet window. So that's sort of the, that's the window that I really wanna focus in on. About 2,000 patients undergo congenital heart disease, congenital heart surgery in the United States every year. Um, overall mortality is low, right? So less than 2% um, will die during their following their surgery. Um, some surgeries are very simple. Surgical ASD closure should have an operative mortality approaching zero. Um, Fontan revision is one of our highest risk surgeries and has a mortality of 9.7%. Um, in other studies in cardiology, adults who are waiting for cabbage have a prevalence of anxiety of 28% and a prevalence of depression of 47%. These are studies in, that were done in Canada um, and Europe where there are often waiting lists and it takes time before you can get your cabbage done. Um, we know that pre-op depression and anxiety is predictive of post-op depression and anxiety. Um, but very little is known about perioperative mental health in this population. So one of the one of my thoughts and the directions that I want to go is looking at something that's called prehab. Um, so as opposed to rehab, which occurs after you have uh, heart surgery, prehab is preparing people for heart surgery. And this um, protocol or thought or schema that was published a couple of years ago and has ongoing clinical trials, really looked at patients who are at the highest risk. So they started to look at frailty risk factors, um, including genetic factors, age, comorbidities, um, and stressors, and looked at patients who were at risk of not doing well after heart surgery. Um, they did other, they're looking at other indices of frailty, um, similar to what a lot of centers are doing with their TAVR patients. And the, the goal is to take patients who are here in the preoperative stage um, and sort of standard of care is that they don't get much better or much worse in the week or two or three or four leading up to surgery. But if you go through prehab, you can improve nutrition, improve exercise capacity and ad address anxiety and maybe get them to a better state before they undergo the drastic event of heart surgery. If you can get them to a higher state, you can uh, minimize that dip and get them to a higher functioning level post-op. Um, similar data in other diseases. So they've done this in uh, liver surgery. Um, they've done it in some similar projects in uh, patients who have undergone cabbage. Uh, and they have found that there's decreased 
um, ICU length of stay, decreased total length of stay, and improved quality of life in that window, in that waiting period window, as well as in the six months follow up. So I think we could really adapt this kind of prehab program and help our patients both in terms of uh, physiologically surviving surgery, but also in terms of mentally surviving surgery. So to embark on a large project like this, one of the first goals is to assess pre-op and post-op anxiety and depressive symptoms. So looking to do a multi-center um, survey on patients and sort of see how, how are they feeling before they have surgery? What are their anxiety and depressive symptoms? And then uh, post-op, see how they're doing. Um, and uh, the, the next step would be really to utilize mixed methods to develop a perioperative intervention. Um, most of our patients are not that frail. Um, most of them are doing some sort of physical activity, at least here in Colorado. Uh, so I think we to focus in on what they want to know, it would be a surveys and using qualitative methods to really design and develop an optimal perioperative intervention. And then really use um, rigorous dissemination and implementation strategies to not only design the project so that it can be disseminated and implemented easily, but also assess those DNI um, to see how it works. Primary outcomes would be decreased anxiety and depressive symptoms. And then uh, secondary outcomes would be looking into length of stay, time to return to school or work, uh, and then actually opioid use to see if we can impact how much, um, how pain is controlled and patients are doing post-operatively. I would like to acknowledge some of my team members in all of this. So Tessa Kroom was the head of the CDC project here in Colorado. Um, Linda Duca was helped with a lot of the analysis. Joe Kay is my partner and the head of the adult congenital program here in Colorado. Uh, Sarah Kelly is a psychologist who works on a, um, in the cardiac center at Children's Hospital. And then of course, Dr. Kumar for helping with this project. Um, we couldn't do anything without, without our clinical support, our medical assistants and our coordinators and our administrative support. And then finally, a special thanks to the Colorado Adult Congenital Heart Disease Patient Advisory Committee. This committee was developed as part of the CDC project and uh, was obviously instrumental in uh, helping me really change my career course and move down the mental health pathway. Um, so I think that's it. Um, I would love to entertain questions. Um, let me know what you guys' thoughts are. Thank you, Dr. Kana. That was fantastic. And I thank you again for waking up so early to present <laughs> this. Sure. You know, uh, this, uh, this is a very important topic. And I think it's a topic that we don't always focus on. And we do a pretty poor job in cardiology in general. I think, you know, in our 15, 20 minute follow up visits to really try and capture anxiety uh, if it's not part of the problem list already. So I, I wanted to hear your thoughts about. Uh, what do you think, so congenital heart disease, do you feel like the prevalence is similar to heart disease in general, or do you feel like it's more in the congenital population in terms of these mental health disorders? Oh, I think it's a very good question. It's just very difficult to know. Um, uh, congenital heart disease is obviously low prevalence amongst the general population. 1% of people are born with congenital heart defect. Um, whereas acquired heart disease is actually very common. Um, as everybody knows, well, that's why we all have jobs here. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, mental health disorders are also very common. So I, I think it's hard to know. There's, there's definitely something about having, having had surgery um, makes a difference. Um, there are problems with having had surgery when kids go through surgery. So children's hospitals have put a lot of resources in making heart surgery and all forms of surgery better. Um, but the patients that I'm seeing in clinic didn't benefit from that. There were no child life experts. There were no you know, the resources. And really, how do, you, how do you coach parents and help parents help their kids be stronger, um, have, more, have better quality of life? Um, 
so now we're left with this cohort of patients that underwent pretty traumatic events. Um, having surgery, they were in the hospital for weeks and pain control was suboptimal. So, and now they're adults and they're trying to deal with, with everything else that adults are dealing with. So I think there's good reason to think that the prevalences are higher in adults with congenital heart disease. Um, that being said, many of my patients are very well adjusted. So I tell my, my colleagues in the hospital, um, have a skewed impression of what adults with congenital heart disease look like because they see that they see the hospitalized patients. Um, and uh, I think, you know, when people come to my clinic, when fellows come to my clinic, they're always a little bit surprised to see that I have fully functioning, participating in society, employed um, patients in my clinic who underwent, you know, some of them are, I have a Fontan that was, um, that clerked for a Supreme Court judge, right? So it's, you know, there's, there's yeah. the spectrum. Yeah, I'm sure it's a little bit like a lot of our patients who have EF of 10 and 15% and are just walking around feeling okay. Uh, yes, and absolutely. Yeah, so in our preventive clinic here, we do we screen patients with a PHQ uh, 9, you know, for depression. Uh, yeah. What tool are you using to screen for anxiety? Because I use the GAD, we use the okay. GAD 7. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Spencer King has a question. Uh, go ahead, Dr. King. Got to get unmuted here. Uh, thanks. Well, I enjoyed that very much for several reasons. My, my first job in 1970 was uh, I was on the staff at uh, Children's and at St. Luke's in Denver. And we used to fly out on a crippled children's program to Grand Junction to see a clinic. Uh, and our conclusion was that Grand Junction was a hotbed of congenital heart disease. We thought there were some uranium tailings or something. I, I don't know if that bore any fruit. But my actual question is, uh, what, what about all the patients in your survey are uh, operated patients, surgically operated? Is that correct? No. So in the in the large, in the population-based studies, it was just having a diagnosis code of congenital heart disease. So some of them will be operated, some of them will not be. So I was sort of curious about whether the effect of having uh, an open ASD closure, for instance, versus a percutaneous closure, uh, pulmonary stenosis, or, is, there, it would be, would, is there an opportunity to understand whether somebody faced with a, a choice, for instance, between an open procedure or uh, a percutaneous procedure might uh, consider uh, mental health issues in, in relation to that? Just a question. No, I think it's a great, I think it's a great question. One we don't know, we don't know a lot about. Um, first of all, Grand Junction is still a hotbed of congenital heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, and by the time they make it over the mountains to see me, um, they are usually not in great shape. So <laughs> it's, still, it's still struggling to get healthcare on the other side of the mountains. Um, I think that I think that the question between open and uh, percutaneous is is a great question. I, I, you know, there's there's still something to be said about having the surgeon be there, and if they get into trouble, they can fix it quickly. So sometimes open surgery is is a nicer option, but generally, whenever we have a patient who has something now, we see if they're a percutaneous candidate first. So we're much more much more likely than even in our, you know, even in TAVERS to in our congenital patients to try to avoid another sternotomy. So if we can do a percutaneous pulmonary valve, we do that even if they're incredibly low surgical risk, um, just to try to avoid the, the number of sternotomies. Um, I think that that recovery window when, you know, when I, I, you know, I sit down with patients and I tell them, okay, it's time for pulmonary valve, and you sort of see the, the dread in their eyes because they remember what happened the last time they went through it. And I say, well, we, we can do it without having to open your chest. We can do it by going through your leg. Um, it'll be a day in the hospital and a couple of days off work. And the, their response is so remarkable that I think that it's easy in hindsight to say, well, you know, it's, it's five or six days in the hospital and six, rec six weeks recovery. But patients know that it's it's a lot more than that and that open heart surgery is a very big deal. The kids seem to sort of 
skip out of the hospital after their open heart surgery. Um, I have not seen an adult recover quite so robustly. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a question about um, people who are seeing, uh, you know, psychologists or a mental health provider outside of the system that you captured, you know, because all the hospital systems that you've captured, if they didn't get their mental health care there. Uh, so when you were looking for the diagnostic codes, is it either a primary or anywhere in the system if somebody coded anxiety or depression? Uh, was that captured or is it only in cardiology clinic visits? No, that's a really great question. So we use the congenital heart disease code to identify patients. Um, so if you were coded with a congenital heart disease during the period of the study, you were in our study. And then we asked the healthcare systems to send all of their, all of their encounters for those patients. So uh, including all payers claims database. Um, so as long as you saw anybody, um, whether it was cardiac in, in nature or not, we were able to get those diagnostic codes, which is why a lot of our patients never even saw a cardiologist um, over the study, which is a whole other issue. Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, are there any other questions or comments from the audience? It's, it's Andy. Just you know, a comment with these patients. I mean, the, there's a whole variety of complexities related to those who had surgery when they were young and their parenting, those who have complex disease that's cyanotic where um, they end up seeing physicians as adults who say, oh, you've got pulmonary hypertension and that's a bad thing and you're gonna die soon. So they stop seeing doctors because of that. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's often a suspicion of these patients when they're not being seen by adult congenital specialists. There's also that transition from when they go from the pediatric hospital to the adult hospital. And, um, so it's, it's just a very complex arena. I guess my, my question would be for physicians who are not directly in the adult congenital realm, what advice would you have to us uh, in, in the care of these patients and uh, avoiding some of the pitfalls that you see from uh, some of the cardiologists that may be out in your community or from the, the uh, primary care physicians? That's a really good question. I, you know, it's, it's tricky. Um, I would say, you know, I go to adult congenital cardiology conferences. I would say as a whole, we're pretty nice people um, and we're willing to pick up the phone and we, 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 we sort of do what we do because we love it and are more than happy to answer questions. So my, my thought really is to, to the community cardiologists or the non-congenital cardiologists is to make friends with a congenital cardiologist and get their phone number and uh, sort of build a working relationship um, so that if something is sort of basic and easy, you can run it by them. But also when things get really complicated, you can you have somebody who can help you with the more complicated patients. I think it's harder um, to, to sort of stay on top of things. So adult congenital cardiology deals with a lot of, you know, although 1% of the population has it, the numbers of each individual diagnosis is very low. So what I've, the, the patients that sort of break my heart are when they've been seeing an, an outside of private practice cardiologist and they've been feeling fine. And it, the cardiologist then assumes that everything is fine. That's a pretty good standard in um, adult cardiology that if you're feeling okay, things are probably going okay. Um, it doesn't always work with congenital heart disease. So by the time they have right heart failure and their volume overloaded, and they send them to me, I would have much rather seen them three, four, five years before um, when it would have been easier to intervene on that valve and get them through surgery in a safer way. So I, you know, I think that just because things seem to be okay on the surface doesn't always mean they're doing okay. The guidelines that we have um, are, they're, they're adequate, they're not perfect, 
um, but they do try to do a good job of um, sort of letting people know the general pathway that they should be going on. So reference the guidelines, give your friendly adult congenital cardiologist a call. Um, yeah, we're here to help. Thank you. Um, we have uh, Dr. Caruso uh, who has a question. Yes, hi, Amber. Um, thanks so much. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, my question is, um, you know, there's the axis between inflammation, depression, and acquired heart failure um, that's being investigated. And some of the data using the Boston Biobank pointed towards uh, a similar axis with congenital heart disease um, in terms of higher rates of CRP and, and BNP and lower rates and lower uh, GFR. My question to you is what do you think from a population standpoint, especially using these large databases like the CDC that we would have available to further you know, investigation into this field? Yeah, I think that the Boston Biobank is really an amazing resource for having that kind of information. Um, so I think that other, other large biobanks, you know, we have, we've developed a small one here in Colorado. Vanderbilt has a good sized one. I think those are really useful. Um, I, some of our patients have BMPs in, you know, we get them when they're in the hospital or things like that, but it gets very challenging um, trying to really understand these things when there's something else going on. Maybe they have endocarditis or maybe there are other issues going on. So I think the large databases are, it's really hard to get into um, some of these specific lab findings. Uh, I, there's clearly a role in understanding population-based um, prevalences and incidences, but it gets tricky. You know, I think even in, in your study, it was, it's hard to um, get into the nuances of their mental health disorder. Is it something that they had several years ago? Is it truly depression? Is it, you know, sort of understanding some of that when you start talking about these very large um, administrative data or even in biobanks? Yes, I think that's a, a fair point. Um, we, we certainly ran into that um, and trying to tease out the nuance just from chart review was rather difficult, but thank you. Mm -hmm. It was great work. I was very impressed. Any other questions or comments? Pooja, yes. Stan Sherman. Yes. Uh, just, just a quick question. Uh, Is going into, uh, you know, this anxiety uh, pre-op, and I would uh, these patients are a little more likely to be uh, drug dependent um, under certain. Uh, Are you going to be taking care of a non-drug way or a drug way? Uh, Dr. Sherman, I'm sorry, you know, you uh, were breaking in and out. Did, did I break up? Uh, oh, yes. Okay, um, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, it was, I was just going to see if, if they were going to avoid drug therapy for this uh, problem because they may be drug dependent after uh, being treated for their anxiety. Oh, I see. You know, I, I think it's a good question where... Um, so if somebody has significant anxiety beforehand, do you try a little bit of benzodiazepine or something like that to, to get them through surgery? Um, I, yeah. yeah, I really don't. Um, I, I think that some patient, I think that you do, I think you do increase the risk of dependence. I think there are other better ways to manage anxiety than to use, um, and then to use benzodiazepines. Um, I mean, some, you know, even the SSRIs can be helpful um, and uh, can help with some of the post-op depression symptoms as well. So I, I would much more likely to lean in that direction and then work on cognitive behavioral therapy. So any, any project like this is going to clearly involve mental health professionals, um, which I'll admit I'm not, and uh, um, try, to, try to develop a more robust system. I think that in the hospital, it becomes very easy to give benzodiazepines as well, and you sort of set patients up for difficulties when they go home. Thank you. 
Um, if there are no other questions, I want to th uh, thank Dr. Kana again for your time. That was really amazing to bring uh, attention to this issue. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to present. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.